got a scooter. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm Leanne Nguyen here with Sharks for Kids. And this week we're continuing with our Google Hangouts, highlighting some women in shark science. We partnered up with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Today we have a special guest, Katie Gledhill, who is actually going to be helping us explore by the seat of our pants live from South Africa. Um, Kat is a research scientist at the South African Shark Conservancy, which is a nonprofit organization and is located in South Africa. She's also a research affiliate with the Molecular Breeding and Biodiversity Group at Stellbosch University. So we just ask that all the classes, please turn your microphones onto mute. We are going to give it, hand it over to Kat, who's going to present some live sharks and talk to us about some research that's oh, being done sorry. there. And then we will have time for questions and answers. At any time, if you have technical difficulties, please feel free to use the group chat. Thank you very much. Take it away, Kat. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Oh, I can't hear you, though. <laughs> She's sideways. Am I sideways? Yes. Second, guys. Yeah. Sorry. Is it kid? Oh no! We oh, heard her a moment. Shark diver and live shark. Am I back? Oh no! Oh no! It worked before. I know. Am I back? Is your volume all the way up and your microphone on? Yeah. Um... Volume. Sorry, folks. I don't know so why I just a can't moment ago. Rid, oh, can I get rid of that? Hi. Can you hear me okay? Okay. No. And is it both? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so Lisa Baskin, can you hear me? Okay, so I can. So we're not being silly, right? Yeah. Our microphone is on. Yes. No, it's not. It's off. Can you guys hear me? Right See there. me? Oh, right. oh that's so sad. Yeah. Oh. I'm so sorry. Oh. Where's okay? I'm gonna try. Should I try joining? No, maybe. She's rejoining. But it's hang tight. Hello, can you see me now? Hear me now? Yes. We can see and hear you, Kat. You can? Yes. Perfect. Okay, good. Slight technical difficulty, but here I am. Um, thanks for the nice introduction, Leanne. Uh, my name's Katie Gledhill. So I don't hear Kat, but apparently other people can hear her. Some other people can. Can you, okay. those of you who can hear her, give us a thumbs up if you can hear Kat. Okay. So I'm That's the only person that can't hear Kat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, Kat, yeah, go ahead, um, hand it over, and then let me know when you are finished so we can do some questions and answers. Perfect. Okay, so my name's Kat. I work at the South African Shark Conservancy, which is a small nonprofit organization in the beautiful coastal town of Hamanis in South Africa. Um, I'll show you just on my do office doorstep in just a moment how close to the ocean we really are. And as Leanne said, I've also got some li live sharks to show you guys at, in our tanks here at SAS. So I've been working here for about eight years now. Um, prior to that, I was working at Bimini Biological Field Station in the Bahamas, which is actually where I worked with Leanne and also with Gillian Morris from Sharks for Kids. Um, so I was there for about four years before coming here. Um, I'm also doing my PhD at the University of Technology in Sydney, but most of my research is based here in South Africa. 
So the species that I work on are mainly cat sharks, which are the ones I'm going to show you today. Um, but here in Southern Africa, we're really, really, really lucky because we've got an incredible biodiversity of sharks and rays and chimeras, which are sharks and their relatives. So there are about 200, the last study that was done said at 210, but now we're up to about 250 different species, which is absolutely incredible just in the region here. So um, of these 250 species or so, about 30 of them are endemic to the region, which means they're found nowhere else in the world. That means we have um, a special place that we have to protect and protect these unique species. Um, also because they're in such a specific distribution range or habitat range as well, um, it also means that they're sometimes susceptible to more pressures from humans, like environmental pressures even, such as climate change, or also fishing pressures as well. Um, so we're working in a really unique place, which is amazing for me because I have a large choice of different um, animals that I can work with. Um, and historically as well, a lot of the research in the region has been focused on quite a few or just a few different species, such as white sharks. Um, but as I said, we actually have an incredible biodiversity here. So it's good to study a lot of different animals. So I've got a whole range of different props for you to show you just before we get to the actual sharks themselves. So as I said, I mainly work with cat sharks that you'll meet in a minute. But these guys, they give birth to little eggs and I have a whole bunch in my hands. So you can see here, this is a little shark egg. Um, this is a dark shy shark egg, which I'm going to show you in just a moment. Um, so you can imagine, you can see how big it is in the size of my hand. You can imagine how small these little baby sharks are when they're born. They're super cute. And we have, I've got quite a few different species of sharks. As I said, I mainly work with cat sharks. Um, and here, what's really cool is that there was a global study done um, a few years ago now by the IUCN shark specialist group that was assessing the conservation status of um, all sharks and rays all over the world and they're in the process now of updating that um, but in that global study they found that cat sharks are one of the least threatened families however here in South Africa we actually have all of the endangered critically endangered and vulnerable species here um, which is what my research tries to focus on, trying to look after threatened species and also species that are data deficient. So that means they're species that we actually don't know enough about to be able to assess their conservation status. So my research is really trying to bridge those gaps in knowledge um, and try and do science that helps inform conservation and management strategies. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment when I show you some of the sharks. Um, so as I said, these are some of the little shark eggs that we've got here. And like a chicken, sorry, it's a, I'm sorry, it's a dead baby shark, but it's very sciencey and important. But what you can see, I don't know if you can see here, but there's a little yolk. So just like a little baby chicken would in an egg, um, they grow on a yolk. And then when they're ready to hatch, again, tiny little size, the little sharks are born um, just as a live swimming shark would be, all ready to go and look after itself in the wild. So there's no parental care in sharks. Um, the mummy sharks just go and find a special place to lay their eggs to make sure that they're protected. And I'll show you again the kelp where they're born. And this is also another one of my favorite species. This is an egg. You can see the size of the hand against my hand, the size of this one. This is a skate. So this is from Rastaraja alba or a spear nose skate, um, which is an important fishery species here in Southern Africa. And then some populations in the world, such as in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, this species is listed as uh, critically endangered. Um, so why are sharks endangered? I have here another basket full of goodies, a basket full of dried shark fins. So sharks are threatened for many reasons. Um, sometimes, as I said, it's human things like habitat destruction or climate change, but historically they're also fished. And these dry fins, uh, this is a hammerhead fin, very valuable um, shark fin. There's actually uh, different values based on different species of different shark fins. Um, but this is one of the reasons that sharks, a lot of sharks are endangered. 
or at risk of endangerment. Um, it's because pe they've been fished just for their fins a lot of the time. Um, there's also, they're also eaten um, the meat as you would any other fish, um, especially in Australia where I'm from. Um, originally, uh, they're used as fish and chips. Same with the UK a lot. Uh, a lot of them are used as um, fish and chip meat. But as I said, for their fins a lot of the time. Um, the species I work on, as I said, little cat sharks, they don't have very valuable fins. They don't have much of fins, as you'll see. Um, however, they also are not so much targeted, so people aren't trying to catch cat sharks themselves. But in a lot of fisheries, like a lot of trawl fisheries, where a fishing boat will go out with a big net and trawl along the bottom, bottom of the ocean, um, that's where they catch a lot of cat shark species. Also here in South Africa, a lot of our species are near shore and we have a lot of lobster fisheries or crayfish fisheries and they put out big or small <laughs> traps uh, for lobster to crawl into and cat sharks are caught a lot in those. Um, and the lobster fishers don't like them because they're also taking away the bait and taking up room that could be for lobsters. So a lot of the time they're left to die um, rather than just returned back to the ocean. So that's ha what's happening here and why some of our species are threatened. Um, as I said too, a lot of these species are endemic to the region. We have about 28 different species, which is just amazing. Um, so a lot of these species have really small home ranges um, and they're also really highly specific to certain sites, which means they live in a small area. They don't really move around much. So if we have a population that's really restricted in size and also in size geographically, but also in a population that's in one specific spot, that means they can be at risk if that population, for example, if something comes along and wipes them out, we don't, they might not necessarily be able to move into another area or other sharks come in and, um, and take over that area from another location. So another one of the things I've got here, this funny little thing, is a little looks like a little piece of spaghetti. We call them spaghetti tags. So these are what we tag our sharks with. Might be a little bit difficult for you guys to see, but what they have on it is a code that's made up of um, a letter and some numbers and also a telephone number that you can call and report these. So all of our sharks are tagged with this. Um, these little tags, so any shark that's over 40 centimetres, so about that big, um, we tag with one of these. And this goes into a national database that's been running since the 1970s. It's a really great program um, managed by the Oceanographic Institute, or ORI. So it's not only us in the South African Shark Conservancy, but um, people and fishers and scientists and people from all over the region are tagging, again, not only sharks, but other fish as well. So it goes into a large database and we can get an idea of movement patterns, how much individuals have grown, um, population size and all sorts of interesting information we can get from that. So every time, as I said, we put one of those tags in, but... <laughs> what my research is really also focused on um, is we take a little fin clip. So a tiny, tiny little piece of, um, a tiny little piece of fin that doesn't hurt the animal. It's like having your fingernails cut or something like that. Um, so it's not very invasive. And I take that back to my genetics lab and I can do all sorts of interesting things and answer all sorts of interesting questions. So what I'm currently working on is um, molecular species identification. And that means I can go back into the lab, I can extract DNA from a shark and I can figure out all sorts of cool stuff. I can compare um, an individual and see there's a thing called DNA barcoding. I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but it doesn't just work for sharks, but it works for all animals in the world. And there's a certain gene that I can zoom in on and amplify and I can figure out based on that uh, which species a shark belongs to. So that's very cool. So as I said, it's really um, handy for things like this, a fin. Technically, I can take a little piece of that fin and without knowing what species it's from, I can go back into the lab and I can extract the DNA. And once we have a good reference database, which is key, 
um, a good reference database, then we can have a look at what sort of species it is. Um, I can also look at how at different populations along the coast, which is one of the other things I'm looking at, and I can see whether these different populations are intermingling with each other. So whether they, whether there's connectivity, whether the populations are fragmented, um, and things like that. There's lots of different things that we can do with DNA and genetics, um, but I won't bore you that, with that because we've got to get to the sharks. So just keep in mind, um, if you have any questions, uh, we'll have question time at the end. Um, so what I think we will do now, firstly, I just want to show you my doorstep because it's absolutely incredible and it's one of the most unique places in the wor world where I can sit at my desk you might not be able to hear it because we've closed all our windows, but we literally have the ocean um, lapping on our doorstep. It's very, very cool. And this is where we go and collect our sharks. So I literally have sharks on my doorstep, which is very, very cool. So I'll just take you through. Um, bear with me. I hope I don't make you too seasick as we go around. And then I'll take you into the lab to see our live sharks. So this is my office view. I don't know how well you can see, but right down here is where, right down here is where we catch our sharks, literally just there. Um, so as I said, beautiful, beautiful little place. And I just have to walk a few do doorsteps to get to my study species. It's very, very special. So come through and I'll take you to the sharks in the lab. I might just see, I've got my friend Joshy here. I'm just gonna see if I can, hopefully this doesn't mess stuff up, if I can turn my camera around. Perfect. All right. So this is one of our shark tanks. This is a little touch tank that we have, um, not only for research, but it's a really great educational tool. So not just for things like this, but we can bring in classrooms and show them our sharks here. So I've actually got two little species here at the moment. This is one little fella that's swimming around and picking, and picking out. This is my favorite shark species in the world. You'll see why. So I'll try and keep him in the water as much as I can. But this is a little leopard cat shark. So you can see that it's got these beautiful, beautiful little spots, just like a leopard. Um, I'll let him go for a second. And then I'll just pick up this one here. So you can see these are really small sharks. And these are not babies. These are probably a few years old, these guys here. This is another one of my study species, um, the dark shy shark. There are four species in this genus that I'm looking at. Um, and they're also really important from a conservation perspective because uh, they, there's a critically endangered, a vulnerable um, species in this genus. And they're really hard to tell apart. Um, so as I said, part of my work is looking at the molecular species identification. <laughs> identification. So looking at their DNA, but I'm also doing morphometric work because in fisheries and in a lot of um, reporting on these species, they're lumped together. So they're always just written down as shy sharks, um, which is concerning when we have some um, threatened species in this category and we want to be able to get an understanding of how many they are and where they're distributed. But if we're putting them all into one bucket, then it makes it very difficult for us to figure out population trends over time and things like that. So I'm trying to firstly try and figure out if there's some way that we can tell these species apart that will help people in the field and things like that. And then just also see how closely they are related. And um, it'd be very interesting. I've got some cool science coming out soon on that stuff. We've just submitted or just submitting a paper right now on that. So, like I said, we've also got, these guys lay eggs. These are live little baby sharks that are growing in here. I don't think you can see the baby sharks at the moment. No, you can just see the yolks in there. 
So sometimes when we bring these guys into the lab, they'll lay eggs. We've also had people that have found live eggs on the beach that have come in here and we call it our little nursery. So we just let them live in the tank until they grow up and then we'll release them out into the wild once they're big enough. So all these guys, um, we don't keep forever. We, as I said, we keep some for educational purposes. And then we also are running some, you, you'll see a lot of black bags and stuff behind me. We're also running some behavioral experiments here. But see how cute are these little guys? So I'm quite obsessed with cat sharks, especially leopard cat sharks. Um, let me just see, you can see here too, they live in kelp. So we've got um, really amazing kelp forests here in Southern Africa. But you can see, you can see that little guy hiding in there. Um, you can see how well cam camouflaged these guys are. So they hang out in the kelp forests um, and in some areas there's a lot of them. So that's also something that's really important to consider too. We're trying to figure out how these guys interact with their um, environment and the larger sort of ecosystem. So you've probably heard of sharks as apex predators like white sharks, so I shouldn't be mentioning that species, <laughs> and things like that. But they say that these ones might be like mesopredators. So they're not in, like the top, top of king of the ocean, but they might have important, um, important functions in the larger food web and ecosystem. So that's another thing that we're trying to figure out here at SAS. I'll just pick this guy up so I can show you some of the features of it. This one's a little more chill than the leopard running around. You can see they've got really beautiful, beautiful little, almost like tiger eyes. And they've got gorgeous little stripes. Again, I'll show you a couple of features. One, one good thing about these ones too, is they're quite hardy, meaning they're okay to keep in captivity. You'll notice that this guy's breathing. So you can kind of see him, yes, him opening his mouth open and closed, um, which is, there's a common misconception that all sharks must swim to breathe. These guys can actually just sit on the bottom just like they are or they have been when we came over. And you can see very nicely, good demonstrating there, <laughs> breathing in and out um, and passing the water over its gills. So what it does is breathe the water in and it comes out through its gills and that's how it takes up oxygen, just like we would take up air through our lungs. I don't know if you can see the little dots of like pepper all over, all over the snout or here. Sorry, I'm trying to look at where I can see on my screen. Um, and what this is, is <laughs> ampule of um, Lorenzini, which is um, sharks have the regular five senses that we do, but they also have another sense, which is very, very cool, which is picking up electrical currents. And that's what, that, that's what those little structures do. They can pick up movement. So if there's a struggling fish or animal, or whatever, underwater, that's how they can sense it without just relying on their eyes and nose and other senses that we usually do. And you can imagine some places in the ocean get quite dark, um, so that's another great adaptation that sharks have. Um, let me just get this guy again. So you can also see this is a male. You can tell by its modified um, appendages here, <laughs> by its pelvic fin. Um, but most sharks, as I said, let's see if we can have, no. Sorry, I also don't like, I don't want to hold on to them for too long. I want to show you some of the features, but not to keep um, harassing the poor babies. As I said, they do very well in captivity, these guys, and we always monitor their stress levels and everything like that, and don't keep them for too long. Um, anything else? Okay. Um, I think I'm probably running a little bit lower on time, so I will see. I'll probably hand you over to Leanne, who will be able to facilitate some questions if you guys have any questions. All right, so I was listening along to the live version on the actual YouTube page. So there's just a little bit of a lag, but it seemed okay. awesome. Thank you so much for showing us some species. No worries. So 
What? Let me pause that. All right, so what we'll do is we'll go ahead and take some questions. We'll take two questions from each class. We'll start off with um, Miss Brecca's class. We have some fourth graders from Ontario, and then we will move on to Miss uh, Gatusko's class. So go ahead. What do you think the coolest fact is about sharks? That's a very good question. Um, I am, what I find really cool about sharks, as I said, there's incredible biodiversity. So there's over a thousand different species of sharks, rays and chimeras found all over the world. Um, and we've got about 20% of them here in um, southern Africa but I think it's really amazing the diversity so we've got those small little cat sharks that I showed you then we've got huge tiger sharks and great whites and things like that and I think it's really amazing how they're all so different so I said the sharks that we have lay eggs some give birth to live young um, then there are species like sawfish or bull sharks that can go from salt water to fresh water um, so I just, there's um, so many amazing things, but it's really the diversity in the species and also the diversity in their lifestyle that I find amazing. Great. Okay, Audrey, quick, quick. Okay. Why are you guys hunting the sharks for the fins? Good question. Um, I'm personally not hunting them for their fins. I've got some here as an example. Um, but they're actually a really, really valuable um, seafood um, product. So there's a culture where they're finned for um, and used for fins and used for soup, um, which is also um, which is a luxury item. So some sharks are hunted because they're a good food source, and in developing regions, particularly near where I work in the Western Indian Ocean, um, they're used for food. And that's one of their primary sources of protein. However, this is a luxury item. They don't need to be eating shark fins necessarily, but it's more of a status thing. So that's where I think we can make a bit of a difference. Um, some people definitely need food. I find that a completely different issue. Um, but when it comes to things like luxury items that we could probably do without to survive, um, it's something where we should make a bit of a change. Okay, so great questions. Um, I'll review all of them. Uh, the next time, next class we'll go to is Miss Gatusko's class. We have some fifth graders from Auden Road Intermediate School. So we'll take two questions. Lots of questions. It's great. Uh, Hannah, go ahead. Um, a little bit louder, Hannah. Do you ever work with larger, larger sharks? sharks? Do I ever work with larger sharks? I don't so much now. Uh, in my old job where I worked in the Bahamas, I used to work with very large sharks. Um, also in Florida too. I've worked with almost four meter tiger sharks. I used to do that regularly every couple of weeks. Um, bull sharks, hammerheads, all sorts of species. So I definitely have previously worked with larger sharks. And I guess sometimes here uh, we attend fishing competitions where we tag all the animals that the fishermen are um, catching, recreational fishermen. So there I work with larger sharks, but I really like the small guys too. I think they're very cool. And go ahead, Lily. How many sharks have you rescued in a year? How many sharks have you rescued within a year? Ah, that's a good question. I don't know how you can quantify that. Um, I mean, we certainly um, save some directly. Uh, for example, as I said, some of the ones that come into the um, nursery or something like that, or if we um, save an injured animal, I guess. Um, but then I guess you can't also put a number on, you know, efforts like this and putting um, outreach and... I mean, who knows how many sharks that we're saving when we're also managing our fisheries well and putting in conservation initiatives. Um, so hopefully we can save as many of the right species as we can. Does that answer your question? 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right. I think you're done answering. So Kat, if you don't mind, when you're done answering the question, if you just give me a thumbs up. Um, we have two questions on the group chat and they're from Ms. Baskin's class. So the first question is, do those captive sharks exhibit catatonic immobility? Good question. Um, these ones don't really uh, do uh, don't really go into tonic immobility as much as other species. Uh, the species I worked with in the Bahamas, lemon sharks, do it really well, where you turn them over and they almost go to sleep, and you can we could even put them on the bottom of the ocean and they would stay there. Um, tiger sharks do it really well as well. That were one species that went into tonic very easily, um, but these species not so much. All right. And the second question that the class asked, we make it work. The second question they wanted to know is, what do you feed those captive sharks? Good question. So we try and um, we have a range of different bait that we feed them, usually pilchards, um, but sometimes they eat like little squids and things like that as well, but mainly pilchard that we cut up, uh, they're very fussy. Sometimes they cut into nice little pieces for them. All right. So we'll go ahead and take two questions from, um, hopefully they're still there. Oh, I see that they're still there. How about Miss Bola's class from Prairie Grove Junior High? Go ahead. Um, I have a question. Have you ever seen a baby shark hatch? And if so, how do they hatch? I have seen baby sharks hatch. So when they're just about ready to hatch, as I said, from one of these little egg cases, um, they almost just, it's like they outgrow their home and they push themselves out. Um, we have also, um, we've, seen, we've had quite a few hatch here in the lab and sometimes they're just ready to open up and then we just see a little shark come out. It's super cute. I'll see if I can somehow link a video another time. We've got lots of them of little baby sharks hatching. All right, Gemma. All right. So we'll take one other question from that class. Um, and then we'll move over to Miss Walter's class. Waltler. All right. Where did you get that picture from? In behind you. you want that a good question. So, sorry, I'll just... For a second, this one here. Um, I'm sitting at my colleague Meg's desk at the moment, uh, who's the founder of the South African Shark Conservancy, and someone painted it for her. <laughs> but it's very pretty. We've got lots of... We're very nerdy. We've got shark pictures everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll take two questions from, uh, we have a school calling in from Cayman, Cayman International School with Miss Wattler. Awesome. Um, what, what made you want to work with sharks? Very good question. Um, so I've always been interested in animals and nature ever since I was a small girl. Um, I was always, I grew up in Australia, we're always by the beach and exploring rock pools and swimming and snorkeling and things like that. So I've just always had a like massive passion for animals. Um, so I also decided when I was a little bit older, my mum always laughs at me because when people would ask me what I wanted to do with my life, I would say I'm going to save the world um which is quite ambitious and i still feel the same way but maybe a little bit more refined um so i went to university to study um, environmental science and majored in marine biology and i just i just really love sharks i got to do a lot of field work and i just wanted to try and work with them so i worked really really hard and did everything Uh, sorry, strategy so that we can save sharks. Thank you. Aww. 
So what is the use of the catfish's dorsal? Are we good? Uh, what is the use of the cat shark's dorsal fin? That's a very good question. So most sharks um, will use their dorsal fin to swim and will guide them through the water. Um, again, as you can see, this is a hammerhead fin again. So this is quite a large fin. And this helps them. Like a lot of the features of different sharks um, means that they're suited to their environment that way. So hammerheads, for example, will turn around and use their big fin to turn them around very fast in the water. But these guys are more, they're more chilled, like I said, resting on the bottom and things like that. And that's why their fins are quite small because they don't use them for open ocean swimming and things like that. Still the same function, but it's sort of adapted a little bit differently depending on the species. Thanks, good question. All right, so now we'll take two questions from fourth graders at Fremont Intermediate with Mrs. DiMaggio and Mrs. Lesser. All right, hopefully you guys can hear us. Sorry, our video is not working, but uh, here's no the two worries. questions. I can hear you. Um, what is the most endangered, endangered species of shark sharks? Oh, so many good questions. Um, okay, so sharks and relatives. So again, not just thinking about specifically sharks, but if we go into the rays, sawfish, which is another one of my favorite groups of animals, um, they're probably one of the most threatened species in the world or groups of species in the world. So all sawfish are listed as critically endangered or endangered no matter where they are in the world. There are a few places where there's um, a few more of them, but from many places, they've completely been wiped out um, and South Africa is one of those places we used to have sawfish here but we haven't seen a sawfish since oh I think it was like 1999 was the last time anyone saw a sawfish here in South Africa um, and a colleague of ours Ruth Lini, has also been going all over the world and all over Africa trying to look for these animals and not having any luck um, which is really unfortunate so that's definitely one group that are highly threatened all right. Um, Did we get two questions? Take, from them? Sorry. No problem. Why don't we take one more? Oh, sorry. Take for a shark to hatch out of its egg. Good question. Um, so I think you mean, do you mean from when the egg is laid until it grows up and comes out? Is that what you mean? And hatches? Yes. Yes. Okay, so that's a very good question. Um, a lot of it's actually unknown. So there are estimations um, and also they have done experiments in the lab, but we also don't know if what's being done in the lab is the same as what's happening out in the marine environment. So they usually think um, between, there's estimations between like four to nine months, depending on the species. And also the temperature makes a difference too. So um, for example, like if it's a warmer temperature, they might grow quicker. Um, and vice versa. So it also not only depends on the species, but also environmental conditions too. And that's something we need to work more on. <laughs> so if you want a PhD when you're a little bit older, there's a question for you. All right. So we'll take two more questions um, from, we'll get to from Taylorville Junior High. What is the largest species of shark that you have? Good question. So um, in Southern Africa, the largest species, and in fact, anywhere in the world is a whale shark. Um, really beautiful animals. Um, I've been swimming with them in Mozambique and they're absolutely beautiful animals. Um, so they feed on plankton and really big, as the name suggests, just like a whale. So they're the biggest shark. Hmm. Go ahead. Okay, so why are sawfish um, endangered? Very good question. So um, they're fat. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what a sawfish looks like, but it looks like a sort of big chainsaw. Um, they're quite large animals. They uh, mentioned before as well, they go into rivers. 
Um, so they've got large chainsaw <laughs> rostrums or noses. Rostrum is the correct word. Um, they're large bodied. So they're actually encountered a lot in fisheries and things like that. Um, so they get tangled really well in fishing nets, um, which just puts them at risk just by chance. Um, but they've also been targeted in certain areas. So for curios, um, people have just wanted to keep their, their saws as, as a like, trophy. Um, they've also got very valuable fins. So as I said, there's different um, species have different um, values in their fins and the sawfish are very expensive fins as well. So there's quite a lot of different factors that put sawfish at risk. All right. So this, at this time, we're going to end our hangout. So thank you very much for all the classes to join. You want to give a big wave out to the World Wide Web. And thank you so much for Kat for all the information. I'm super excited to listen to the question and answers. Thank you everyone for bearing with all the technical difficulties and everything. And uh, have a good day. And on behalf of Sharks for Kids, stay tuned all week. Have a good one. Oh, thanks hi. very much, Lauren. And if you want to learn more about the South African Shark Conservancy, um, please look us up. Up, we're on all the social medias. So check out Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Just look up the South African Shark Conservancy. I'm happy to get in touch anytime if you guys have any more questions. And again, thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you, Sharks for Kids for having me. And thank you all, all you guys for listening and having such cool questions. Uh, but please feel free to reach out anytime. Thanks.